Okay, today we are doing gluten-free chippy tea. And if you didn't know what chippy tea is, it is a British classic, which um, people eat all the time. So it's basically fried fish, British chips, that's not the crispy things, and mushy peas. So let's get stuck in. Okay, uh, to cook chips in the traditional way, it's supposed to be done in some sort of fat and traditionally lard was used. Now, quite honest, you do not have to do it in lard. You can do it in any vegetable oil, corn oil, rapeseed oil. It makes no difference. If you want to do it in lard, it's your arteries. Go ahead and do it. Uh, what I'm doing here is using a vegetable lard, not an animal lard, because being on the boat, um, I don't want to be throwing lots of oil overboard. And also, I don't want to have lots of oil slushing around because it's a yacht. Sometimes we're leaned way over. So the lard sets very nicely in the bottom of the pan. And I don't have to worry about spillage. But that is actually a not lard at all, is it? It's, it's a, a vegetable lard. Yeah. Okay. Now, chip pans on a boat are a no-no. Uh, the only reason that I use them is because I never leave it unattended and I only cook this when I'm in port So we're not out at sea rolling around with hot fat everywhere I just it's just too big a risk when I'm at sea It's either stir fries which can be done very quickly or it's in Mr. D our thermal cooker That's what happens at sea But when I'm in here. It's as stable as any flat or kitchen or house So I can use this in here, but it must never ever ever be left unattended and if it gets too hot the simplest way to cool it is to pour more oil into it. Never ever under any circumstances put water into these things because it will literally explode and give you horrible burns. If you need to cool a fat pan, pour oil into the fat. Cool, turn off the heat, pour oil in. Works very, very well. It's the only safe way you can cool this stuff down. So I filled this up with chips because I happen to know that this does me and Gainer. So this is our portion size. The other thing I'm going to do with this, because of my limited resources, is I'm just going to preheat it slightly by putting it under the grill. The secret to doing good chips is two things. One, pick a good potato, and two, cook twice. So the potatoes I usually use for this are these ones, which are Maris Piper potatoes. They tend to be rather drier compared to some of the other ones. So when you put them in hot fat, they don't explode which is nice. Traditionally with these, they're about a centimetre on a side. I suppose that's about half an inch if you're an Imperial. Traditionally in chip shops, these are cooked for about five minutes to cook, heat them through. They're set aside for five minutes, then they're put back in the fat. I lack a few resources around here. I'll heat them under the grill to warm them up, and then I'll put them in the fat. Um, it's just my way of doing it. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. At the end of the day, you can do it either way. That's how I'll be doing it here. It used to be that when I was in a domestic kitchen all of my own, I used to make my own mushy peas. It's a process that takes about 40 minutes and consumes more energy than I'm willing to expend here on a boat. So I have bought mushy peas. Now I appreciate they're not as good as the ones I make, but they take two or three minutes to heat up as opposed to 45 minutes of effort. Guess what? And it's the gas as well, isn't it, Bev? It's the gas as well. I could probably make mushy peas in Mr. D, but to be honest, I'd wind up making so many of them, I could probably do the whole marina with mushy peas. Um, that's not really part of the game. So I've got my little pot, and I'm just going to put mushy peas into it, and we'll just have them that way. Mushy peas is traditional with this sort of dish, but um, you can have garden peas or marrow fat peas if you're into that sort of thing. So the ingredients for the batter are extremely simple. It's flour, milk, a bit of salt. That's it. So this is self-raising white flour and it's gluten-free, of course. So why do you use self-raising, not plain? Uh, it just bubbles better. It just makes a nice crispier batter. The plain sort of sticks to the fish and what you tend to get is fish coated in a sort of like a brown layer. That's it. Whereas this one, it sort of bubbles and twists and it just makes it more... It's just more fun. Right, but the recipe is very simple. Take a measure of something. This measure here is a half cup. This is a metric cup or 125 mils. And I'm going to take a half cup of flour, half a cup of milk, a pinch of salt, 
and mix it together. And let it sit for a couple of minutes and that will be my batter. And that's all there is to it. So it's um, equal measures then? Equal measures. If it looks a bit thin and runny, you can add a bit more flour. If it looks a bit too thick, you can add a bit more milk. It just has to be sort of a bit sticky. That's the key. Fine with these gluten-free flours, they tend to look a bit thin and runny, but if you leave them for five minutes, they go as thick as custard. So, um, although this looks quite thin and runny, it's probably going to thicken up quite a bit if I leave it for five minutes. But two rather mismatched pieces of fish. Sadly, this is from the local supermarket, not from a decent fishmonger, which is why it's like this. But, we'll manage with it. So usually what I do is I just put it on kitchen paper and I just dry it off with a bit of ki uh, kitchen roll. It lets the batter stick much better. So all you've got to do is, oh no, these two have turned up again. You had to say fish, didn't you? Yes, Prue, this is Ellie's channel, not yours. Yeah, but it's got fish in it, Bev. I know. Come on, you two, out of here. You can take your fish with you, Prue. So it's been about five minutes and the batter has been left and it now looks like this. You can see how much thicker it's become. Mm, it has, isn't it? I've transferred the hot fat from the chip pan into a non-stick pan and the reason for that is if I put the fish into the frying basket the batter will stick to the basket and the fish will be in here for the rest of eternity which is not good. Okay, you can just drop a little bit of batter in and if it rises to the top and starts to fizz it's hot enough. This is not hot enough but oh, just on the verge of it. So I'm going to let this get a little hotter before I put the fish in. Let's get the excess batter off and don't drop this into the fat because it'll splash everywhere. Lay it into the fat. And it's just about hot enough. It could do with being a bit hotter. Right. Shouldn't have listened to me then. Nope, but as you can see it rises to the top quite quickly because it doesn't stick to the bottom. Okay, so I've got a oven tray with a piece of kitchen paper in it and I'll be putting the fish on that after it comes out of the pan so the oils can drain from it and I'll be keeping it in a heated oven just to keep it warm. It's not a particularly hot oven, I mean you wouldn't burn yourself if you put your hand in. It's just to keep the fish warm and let the oils drain. So I'm just draining it and I just put it on there and then I'll put that in here to warm. And then goes fish number two. Just keep um, an eye on the fish and keep giving it turns, yeah? Yeah, just turn it every so often. The bottom always cooks quicker than the top. No shock there to anybody who spent any time in the kitchen, but there you have it. And this is what you're uh, looking for, is a lovely golden colour. Okay, I've transferred the chips back to the um, frying pan and I've transferred the oil back to the chip pan. I don't put this into the non-stick because if I do it just lifts the non-stick off and the steel rubs on it. Um, these have been moderately cooked through. I did them under the grill like I said. If I was doing it in a traditional way I would have had these in fat for five minutes and then I would set them aside, let them cool a little bit and then I'd be putting them in for their second fry and that's effectively what this is. So. I'm putting them in, it should fizz a bit, and off we go. And do agitate them, otherwise they stick together in a big lump. Every three or four minutes, just give them a good shake. If they sound like they've gone hard on the outside, they're ready. They should be crispy on the outside. And if you're in any doubt, take a fork. These are getting close. The outside isn't crispy yet, but it's getting very close on this. So 
Okay, and for drinks with this, you can have white wine, which is delicious, and a nice chilled white is lovely. But traditionally, chippy tea is had with a mug of tea. Dry, and this is why the chip pan is so useful. So why do you go to all the trouble of making a chippy tea when you can just go to a chippy and get one? And the answer is, of course, we're gluten intolerant on the boat and wheat. The batter is normally made from flour, pure flour, wheat flour, whereas we've made it from gluten-free flour. Now, not all is lost here. Some chippies, when they change their fats, will do a gluten-free day where they will cook the fish in fresh, clean fat to make sure there's no wheat contamination. Um, ask your local chippy if they have a gluten-free day. If you are in the areas where, like um, Northern Ireland, uh, Ballycastle, Morton's Chippy in the Pier has a full gluten-free menu. Well, if one does it, I'm sure other ones do it too. There must be other chippies around the world and places like that that will do gluten-free fish for you. And if they do, give it a go. Why not? But if you can't get it there, this is how you make it at home. And I hope you enjoy it.